Hey everybody, welcome to the Play Action Podcast. This is the special holiday version, so we all dressed up for you in our best holiday. Not really, but it's uh, it is our last one before before Christmas. So happy holidays to you. Week number sixteen of the NFL is here, man. Yeah, man. Everybody have a happy holidays and everything like that. I have no I have no Christmas take that like I do with my Thanksgiving take. I think Thanksgiving is kind of a garbage holiday to be perfectly honest with you. But Christmas, Christmas is good. Christmas is awesome. I like Christmas a lot. Scary. And uh what? it's they, fun. Every every year I get to hear this Thanksgiving take. It's Thanksgiving it's, it's excruci- Thanksgiving is it's garbage. Excruciating every year. Thanksgiving is garbage. Let's be it's honest. A, hey, all hey, you, hey, all you also, do is eat. There's no obligation. It's not like you have this <laughs> huge burden of buying people that you don't really like a bunch of gifts that you don't food. want to spend money on. Oh, yes, you eat. That's gimmicky. The food it's is gimmicky. gimmicky. It oh is. My God. It, the food is gimmicky. I don't, I'm not really into it. Plus, listen, I'm very excited. After a horrible, horrible, horrible week, we're back on the horse, baby, this week. Another good week this week. So, yep. uh, things were, uh, things were great. I'm back, uh, feeling good about sports wagering yet again. All right, so SBRodds.com is where you need to go to see all the lines that we're talking about, the totals, the lines change in real time. It's got all the sports books there, along with the ratings on those sports books, so you can decide where you want to place your money on the weekend. And what's really great, and we talk about it all the time, the importance of shopping around. You can look at the different lines, the different books, decide the price that you like best, and then make your bets there. Again, links right down below us. And also, if you want to subscribe and comment, and thumbs up or thumbs down, depending on what you think about our analysis, would love to have your interaction as well. Uh, here we go starting with the saturday games got two on saturday again this week because uh college football is now in bowl season so here we go indianapolis and baltimore up first baltimore favored by almost two touchdowns here matt even over two touchdowns at five dimes with 14 and a half coming off there anything as far as 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 news and notes we should know about this game yeah i mean the colts as if this could get worse for them linebacker jonathan bostic placed on ir with a knee injury their center ryan kelly placed on ir with a concussion so More people not involved in this game for the Colts. On the Ravens' side, Jeremy Macklin not practicing, but Coach John Harbaugh did say he thinks he's going to be able to go. He also said he's definitely not going to go on IR, so it looks like Macklin is at least very, very questionable to go in this one. But when you look at this spread, I don't know if it really matters. Yeah, Joe, two touchdowns, or at least close to two touchdowns, like I said, in some spots even over two touchdowns. Too many points for the Baltimore Ravens, even though they actually have something to play for and they're at home here? That's a great question because you're right. This is a Saturday game. Baltimore would love to throttle down here, make a statement, and then roll into Sunday and watch to see how the rest of the deck stacks up. Stacks up, excuse me. But here's the Colts. If we're talking about scoring a lot of points in this game, what can we expect from these guys? Six straight games played by Indianapolis have gone under the total. That's got me thinking about going under 41 in this game, which is what's widely available right now. But here's the problem. Baltimore has found a way to score quite a few points over the last few weeks. 27 in Cleveland last week, 38 the week before in Pittsburgh, 44 against Detroit, 23 against Houston, 23 against Green Bay. The offense has come on strong as of late. So I might take the approach of looking at the Baltimore team total in this game, given that they're going up against a really lousy packing it in Indianapolis Colt defense and play that angle here because Joe Flacco and the Ravens seem to have something going, Matt. Yeah, I mean, the only problem here is this is this is just too many points to lay, I think, with, with Baltimore here, considering what you're looking at. I mean, you have a team that isn't really a dynamic offense by any stretch of the imagination. So I think what we're looking at is, like you said, I think you look at this total here, Joe, it is an island game being on Saturday, so maybe we get this thing to creep up a couple of points because, again, everybody loves to bet the overs. Nobody likes to bet unders, and so maybe this thing creeps up a couple points and you can go under here, but certainly not a game I'm looking to play and certainly not a game I feel strong about one way or the other. Next up is uh, Minnesota at Green Bay, and Minnesota has a lot to play for here. Green Bay does not, in fact, announce this week that Aaron Rodgers has been placed on the IR. He came back last week, hopes of keeping their playoff chances alive. That uh, ended come Monday night when Atlanta won that game, and of course, Green Bay fell to the Carolina Panthers last week. Um, this, This game was off the board for much of the early week, and ever since it was announced that Aaron Rodgers is not going to be playing. Uh, Big favorites for Minnesota. In fact, double-digit favorites in some place. Seeing it anywhere available, 8.5 all the way up to 10 over on five dimes. Matt, outside of the Aaron Rodgers news, what else is going on here? Yeah, I mean, let's just let's keep it clear, though. This is still definitely very early in the week, so we could see this. There's no telling how this thing could bounce around here. 
uh, taping this on late Tuesday night. Uh, on the Viking side, they did move tackle Riley Reeve to IR, so he's going to be gone. Kyle Rudolph was on the injury report much of last week and then was a surprise go. Uh, then he's back on the injury report again this week, so we will see about that with him on the Packers. Like you said, Aaron Rodgers, nothing to play for there, so I think it's a smart move by that organization to go ahead and put him on IR there. Devontae Adams, their their star wide receiver, actually kind of having a breakout season for them back on the uh, in the concussion protocol for the second time here in a couple of weeks. Um, listen, I don't know if it's one of those situations where they even look at maybe even shutting him down, Joe. I mean, again, nothing to play for. Certainly a bright young wide receiver here. Looks like Jordy Nelson's pr- pretty much washed at this point. So I don't know if I want to stick him back out there after bruising his brain twice in the last month. Uh, Packers might just go ahead and, and pack up tent here. Yeah, with Minnesota in this situation, I would lay it. There are some eight and a halfs out there, and I'd use them in a six-point teaser, and I wouldn't think twice about it. You'll get into trouble long-term laying big spreads like this on the road, but Green Bay just came out and told you, um, we're done. Season's over. Why would any player want to come out and show up for this game? I get it if you guys are going to be competitors and they're going to want to put good tape out there, but the organization told you they're quitting. And if they're quitting, the message is going to trickle all the way down that this season is over. And the last thing you want to do is have that mentality against the stone cold killer club, like the Vikings who have been smoking people this season, Minnesota, They've been outstanding on both sides of the ball. They're efficient. They're focused. They're prepared. They're going to seize opportunity here. And Philadelphia is going to play Monday night against a packing it in Oakland team. So that jockeying for the number one seed, Minnesota's got to make a statement here. They're going to come out. They're going to play very smart football. I think Brett Hundley is going to have a terrible time trying to move this Packer team up and down the field because let's face it, offense is about timing and precision. And if you've got 11 guys and six of them, or packing it in, you're going to have a real tough time converting on third down and moving the sticks. I like Minnesota virtually every way imaginable here, Matt. Matt, yeah, the, little, I mean, the, little, the little angel on my shoulder is saying, Dave, we do not play divisional rivals <laughs> on the road when they are double-digit favorites in some spots. That's not what we do, but Joe does make an interesting point. What say you about this matchup? Yeah, I mean, listen, I have been really, really loving teasers so far this year. I mean, I listen, you can't play them in college football, you can't play them in basketball, but the NFL, the range of outcomes, Joe, is so incredibly small like it is really really finite the range of outcomes in the NFL so when you see a team like Minnesota at eight and a half like you're talking about at multiple books right now you tease that down under a field goal you're moving it through two key numbers here in a game where sure Minnesota could go out and definitely win this by 10 11 points where you see this is up at some of these other books around there nine tens out there right now but for me I'll go ahead and get this thing under a field goal, under through the through the touchdown, under a field goal here, where I feel confident that even if Green Bay somehow figures out a way to battle here, they're just not going to keep this game within a field goal. I mean, this Minnesota team has a lot to play for still. There's still a lot on the line here these last couple of weeks. So for me, tease this thing under that field goal and feel very confident about it. Again, SBRodds.com is where you need to go to see all these lines that we're talking about changing in real time, ratings of the sports books and much more links right below us now we are on to christmas eve the sunday games first up and joe matt we've been hearing about how cleveland is yeah is the team that eventually has to cover right well they they haven't done that um they're up against chicago though this this week and chicago is six and a half even a seven point favorite in some places at home is this the week matt where where cleveland finally covers against a pretty miserable chicago team I mean, so here we go again with them coming out and saying they might bench Kaiser, and then they come out and uh, today and say, no, never mind, we're not. He's going to play, so don't worry about it. He's this this kid's mind must just be in totally the right place. Whenever they've threatened to bench you like six times throughout the season, actually did bench you one Keeps time. Keeps you focused, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Make yeah. make sure vote of confidence in him uh-huh. for sure. Uh, on the Brown it's the, side, it's the uh, Case Keenum approach in Minnesota. They fancy <laughs> themselves the Minnesota Vikings of the AFC. Yeah, yeah. I mean it's <laughs> almost almost exactly with the the play between these. <laughs> quarterbacks as well as the coaching staffs it's it's um, yeah on the brown side the you know again if it's as if it could get worse they're starting safety Derek kindred got placed on ir with a wrist injury so they're gonna be down yet another guy on that side on the bear side i mean listen this team is just a they're just in limbo here joe as we know john fox is dead man walking here so neither one of these teams with much to play for if you want to find any motivation i guess it would be the browns not wanting to go over for the season but I don't know if that's possible at this juncture with only two games left in the season. I mean, which trend do you want to play here? Cleveland has covered the number in 15 of their last 51 games. 
15 oh. covers in 51 games. But then here's the Chicago Bears, a seven or six and a half point favorite, depending on where you look. And John Fox in his tenure as head coach of the Chicago Bears is zero and seven when closing as a favorite. He has never won a football game as the Bears head coach when listed as the favorite. So what do you do here? Do you jump on this Cleveland train again? Because last week I thought they'd show up against Baltimore. But do you lay seven or six and a half with the Bears, knowing Fox's history and knowing how bad this Bears offense is? This is one of those few teaser plays, which if you move from six and a half to a half, I I don't feel comfortable. And, And give me any other two teams minus six and a half. I'll take the favorite down to a half here. I got to be honest, nothing to do with this game. No side, yeah, they're, no they're, total, don't yeah. trust anyone. There, there, There's some games that you just have to stay away from. Total in this one is at 38, and like you said, Joe, totally not trustworthy on either side of the ball. Matt, can you find any there's, way to make a case for playing this game? Like I said, there's just there's no motivation on either side here, and like I, I like try to find any sort of narrative if I can whenever I feel like that that's the case, but I mean, listen, there's just really not, and I understand Cleveland doesn't want to go over for the season, but at the same time, they just don't have the personnel. They just don't have it to get it done. And, and like you said, Joe, I love to look at these six and a halves, especially with home teams, and see if I can get that down to just a win. But with this Chicago team, I mean, they bring almost nothing to the table as well. I mean, they are big time front runners. Unless they get out to a big lead in a game where they can rely on Jordan Howard, that's really the only time we've seen this Chicago team play well all season long. Every time that they have to come from behind when they get when they get down early and they're trailing. Mitch Trubisky and John Fox and the way they run this offense and the lack of anything on the wide receiver side. I mean, all their guys are injured. Now they're starting tight end also injured as well. I mean, it's just a big time stay away here. One of the ugliest games of the week and a game that if you bet it, you're going to hate yourself because you're going to have to watch it and then you're going to have to watch that. that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> now I think, I think the Cleveland Browns have probably not, not wanted to go Oh, for the entire season. And here we are 15 weeks in and they have yet to accomplish that even once as we head into week number 16. If you're a giant DJ, then you just, you oh, just sure. play the, you just play the money line Cleveland in this. Like, yeah. like, cause like they're not by like kickoff gonna, by kickoff. I'll have action on this game. Like, that's one of those things where like you look at you look at this and it's like Cleveland's not going to cover like Cleveland's not going to cover they're either going to win or they're just going to get killed so I yeah. mean like if, if you're if you're feeling that then you know play the money line on Cleveland for, All right, for so pennies this next game is actually uh, the, lots playing for this uh, uh, both teams very interested in a win here Atlanta at New Orleans Atlanta is the uh, the road dog in this one. New Orleans favored by five and a half at home. I actually love New Orleans in this game. Atlanta's on the short week. But, Matt, as far as injuries go, I mean, New Orleans struggled a little bit for a few weeks there when their uh, starting corners were out. Those guys are back healthy now, if I'm not uh, mistaken, right? So uh, are they back at full strength? What's going on with Alvin Kamara? There's been a lot of question marks recently. Yeah, on the Falcons' side, Tevin Coleman's still in the concussion protocol. But if you saw Devontae Freeman play, it's fine. That like guy's that. a beast. Yeah, guy's yeah. just a guy's just a beast. So uh, they are one of the few teams that really and truly interchangeable. Doesn't matter if one of those guys is out or not. On the Saints side, I mean, you look at this. Even though they kind of struggled with the Jets, there was a couple of turnovers and whatnot. I mean, you look at what they did on offense here. Fired on all cylinders. Breeze, 281 pass yards. You had Ingram rush for 74, receive for 77. You had Kamara rush for 44, receive for 45. Michael Thomas, nine catches for 93 yards and a touchdown. Had two different touchdowns called back. I mean, when this team's firing on all cylinders, you just look and you go, how how do you stop these guys? Like, how do you keep these guys from scoring here? I mean, it's not all good for them. They did place a... Uh, uh, Larry uh, Larry Walford, who's their guard there, is in the concussion protocol. That's a pretty big thing. And then Ted Ginn sat out this past week. They just slotted in uh, Willie Sneed in the slot there. Pretty good. Willie Sneed, obviously a guy that played a big role for them last year. Hasn't really done anything this year, but Drew Brees has familiarity with him. Definitely targeted him several times in that game as well. So, yeah, I mean, Dave, I'm, I'm with you. My initial inclination here, um, this Falcons offense, Joe, we keep waiting for it to click, and we keep waiting for it to click, and it's clicked on like two occasions this year when, you know, you look at the talent on both sides of the ball. I mean, when you, you look at uh, the talent in the passing game and the rushing game, and you just go, what the hell is going on here? This, this should be a team that's going out there and just blowing it out of the water every single week. Dave had it at the top. This is going to be an ass-kicking. This is probably the top play of the week going with the Saints here for a variety of reasons. 
I love the fact that the Saints looked flat against the Jets last week, or at least the final score gave the appearance that that was a relatively flat game, considering they were massive favorites. They were looking ahead to this. It was just a few weeks ago. They went to Atlanta on a what a Thursday night. They had that game. And Breeze threw, throws this awful interception late and possibly cost them the number one, number two seed in the NFC. Now you get your redemption spot. Now you get a chance to kick a division rival out of the playoffs, a dagger game. Everything about this game screams New Orleans. I'm not even concerned about the short week for Atlanta and all those other factors. I think the Saints put it on the Falcons here. I'm going to be all over New Orleans in this game. Yeah, Dave, you mentioned it. Crawley and Lattimore both back, both healthy. Lattimore just, I mean, listen, one of the top five corners in all the league graded by Pro Football Focus. The guy's been, as a rookie, I mean, as a rookie, one of the very best corners in all of the game. They're going to stick him on Julio Jones. They're going to say, you're going to have to beat us with Muhammad Sanu, and I just don't think that's going to be enough. I mean, as as we talked about, with this team healthy on offense, how is Atlanta, who allowed uh, Jameis Winston to have probably his best game of the year? I mean, Jameis played pretty well. 299 yards, three touchdowns, yeah. Played pretty well against Atlanta. How are they going to stop Drew Brees and these weapons right here? I don't see it happening. Joe, I'm with you. One of my favorite plays of the week, probably the game that I'll have the most money on this week. Uh, Love that game. Hate this one. Denver, Washington, get me away. Washington favored by three and a half, three over on five dimes uh, at home. Forty and a half is the total in this one. Both teams, again, nothing to play for. I want nothing to do with this one. Matt? Yeah, on the Broncos side, Trevor Simeon got placed on IR. So, and as we tape this right now, they don't know who's going to start at quarterback. I don't Who think cares? it really matters. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it really <laughs> matters. Uh, but Trevor Simeon is on IR. Emmanuel Sanders re-injured his ankle, so he is questionable in this game. They put their linebacker Shane Ray on IR. So, Broncos just an absolute dumpster fire this year. Complete train wreck on the Redskins side. It'd probably be easier for me to name all the people that are healthy than the people that aren't on the Redskins side of the ball. So it's one of those teams where just one of the worst snake bit, absolutely unlucky teams this entire season. Everybody going down, offensive players, defensive players, all kinds of stuff. Still found a way to uh, to cover last week, though. Give me the under in this game. It's sitting right around 40 and a half, 41. We'll see how it plays out throughout the week. Last four games for the Redskins. 20 points, 14 points, 13 points, 20 points. On the flip side, Denver's last how many games? 16, 17, 14, 9, 23, 25. Neither team's lighting up. Both teams are looking to the offseason. You probably get a decent amount of punts in this game. Guys just want to get off the field and go home. Maybe if it's an Osweiler situation, some of these dudes are going to want to go out there and put some decent tape out. I don't see a whole lot happening here. This feels like it's going to be just like last week's Washington-Arizona game, which had virtually nothing happen throughout. Lean to the under in this matchup. Yeah, it's scary to tease an under, Joe. I understand that, but like, if you got this up to 46 and a half, like this feel, that feels like a slam dunk to me. In, I can't in imagine one. it getting beyond that. Like, like 46 and a half just seems like a slam dunk to me. I and mean, whenever you look at this, I'm not going to say that the Denver defense is back. I won't go that far, but what I will say is if you watch them play the last couple of weeks and if you have things going on, you watch these games, even though these teams don't have anything to play for, Denver's defense actually kind of looks like they've at least gotten it back together a little bit here. Um, I think they're going to get after Kirk Cousins pretty good. Like we mentioned, it's an infirmary there for Re- for the Redskins. I mean, he just has no weapons anymore. Every running back is basically hurt. All the wide receivers, tight ends, everything is hurt um, on the Washington side. So, Joe, you get that to 46 and a half. Boy, that is a that's a very tempting number. I can see why it opened at 42 and already <laughs> and already plummeted down as quickly as it did. Uh, Tampa Bay at Carolina. Um, Tampa Bay, you know, they had themselves not a terrible showing against the Atlanta Falcons, at least on offense. Uh, Jameis Winston, as you mentioned a moment ago, Matt, looked looked pretty good in that game. Carolina, on the other side of the ball, has a couple of issues on defense with an injury and suspension. So should they be double-digit favorites at home here? Total is at 47, 46 and a half in a couple of places. Uh, but they're 10-point favorites across the board, with the exception of over on five dimes. They're 11 and a half point favorites, Matt. What do you yeah. say about the uh, the Carolina defense? Can they can they limit Tampa Bay's offense that much where Carolina should be huge favorites like that? I mean, unfortunately, the Bucks did not come out of that game uh, healthy. They placed O.J. Howard uh, on IR. He has a foot injury. Deshaun Jackson hurt his ankle, tried to get back in there and give it a go, but he ev- eventually was forced out of that game. He is very questionable for this week. They benched Doug Martin before the game for a violation of team rules, so there's all kinds of stuff going on there as well. A guy that, if you watched Hard Knocks, was 
kind of a rah-rah guy for that team, and now he apparently is soured on everything, getting uh, suspended for for a violation there on the Panthers side. Like you mentioned, Thomas Davis, uh, originally a two-game suspension, did get bring, brought down to one game, but that is this game, so he's going to miss uh, this game, which is a pretty big blow there. I mean, this Panthers defense is not one of the ones that comes to mind at first whenever people talk about the elite defenses in the NFL, but when you really look into the numbers and you watch how these guys fly all over the field, I mean, this is a defense to be reckoned with for sure. It's certainly something that I'm going to be looking to in the playoffs because I think these guys can can keep this team in just about every game that they play, even when Cam Newton, uh, Joe, isn't at his sharpest. You know that feeling when you're about to go on vacation, a nice vacation, one you've been planning for months, and you're going to leave maybe Saturday. So you just got to get through that last work week. And you're relatively focused right up until you get to Friday. And then Friday you show up and you're pretty much checked out. You get through the morning and then it's just going through the motions before you can go home and go on vacation. That's Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay just had their Super Bowl on Monday night at home, national TV. John Gruden's going into the ring of honor. Here come all the former players to say something nice. Here comes Atlanta. And you still just couldn't get it done. Like, once again, you found a way to not make it happen against the Falcons here. So now on a short week, you got to travel to Carolina to face this defense with two games to go in the regular season and nothing to play for. They're going to walk up to Carolina, much like that Minnesota game we talked about earlier. They're going to get their teeth kicked in because they're not going to be prepared, and they're going up against a very ferocious team, a very savvy team that's playing for playoff position. I don't know if I'd lay it all the way. I'm pretty sure I'm going to have some exposure on the spread outright. I will tease this down as well. I like Carolina to really put it on the box. Yeah, I mean, I hate to feel like I missed the boat because certainly that nine number that it opened is is much more favorable than the 10 that it sits at right now. That being said, uh, this just has ass kicking written all over it right here. Does Winston Winston come across to you as a guy who's going to rally his team here? Well, and the other thing is you look at w, this, and Joe. You, right you, you got you, you got Carolina that, that got Greg Olson back this past week, and Greg Olson looked like Greg Olson for the yeah, first time. Fi- finally, in, in, right? Yeah. Yeah, in, in quite a while. I mean, there's just a lot to like about what's going on with Carolina. And listen, we talk about teams that are motivated and teams that are not. These teams could not possibly be on the further end of the spectrum here because Carolina can still win that division. Carolina has a chance that they could really uh, do themselves a lot of good by winning these last two games of the season here. So, I mean, this is a Carolina team with everything to play for and a Tampa Bay team that down there in Florida, Joe, like you mentioned, maybe they they got a, a nice little beach house or whatever it might be on the water. They got a nice little place that they're ready to just kind of kick up and drink some margaritas. I think Carolina rolls in this one. Well, speaking of nice little houses in Florida where you just want to kick up and enjoy a margarita, maybe the Miami Dolphins would like to join those Tampa Bay Bucks. Unfortunately for them, this week they have to go to Kansas City to play the Chiefs at Arrowhead and they once again are double digit favorites or double digit dogs rather on the road. Uh, Kansas City is coming in as 10 and a half, even 11 and a half point favorites uh, in most spots. 43, 43 and a half is where this is widely available. Another one of these games where, look, Matt, it, it, Kansas City last week, these past couple of weeks, have gotten Kareem Hunt back involved in the game. Last week, he smashed. Maybe they figured it out on offense. I just don't know if I really trust them yet. One thing I do know is that I don't trust the Miami Dolphins in this spot. Yeah, this is an under game written all over it right here. Dolphins lose by eight to the Bills. We called that, saw that coming a mile away. That, that was going to be a huge letdown game. One of the reasons why I had such an amazing week because that game was was heavily invested in, I will say, uh, yeah, in that one. Uh, on the Chiefs' side, look, they control their own destiny, obviously. I mean, it's this yeah. game and then at the Broncos. And uh, listen, this is one of the things uh, Joe and I were talking before we went on air here and probably something I should have picked up on a little bit earlier. But even in these games where they haven't looked good at Arrowhead, teams just have not been scoring on them at Arrowhead. Like now that it doesn't say that they've been dominating the games, but they just have not been giving up points at home. And then we look at how the Andy Reid suspended, uh, uh, handed over the play calling. And what did we see? We saw Kareem Hunt get a massive workload. Did they follow that up with another massive workload? Yes. And what happened? Positive game flow yet again for these guys. So here's one of the things why this just reeks of under one. They just haven't been letting people score a lot in Arrowhead Two. The Dolphins have actually been riding Kenyon Drake as if a, if he's a bell cow back in there. I mean, like giving him all the touches, basically not letting Jay Cutler go out there and sling it all over the field and eventually throw the the couple picks every game like he's, he's destined to do. So you got two teams that you figure are going to rely very, very heavily on the run. Kareem Hunt, 
is the key to success here for this Chiefs team. Kenyon Drake, key to success here for this Dolphins team. That clock keeps running. Tick, 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 tick. Under 43 and a half is the play for me here, Joe. There's not a whole lot that needs to be said on top of it. The under is hit in five of the last six Kansas City games. And what Matt's talking about at Arrowhead Stadium, over the last 62 home games, the under is 43 and 19. Miami had their Super Bowl two weeks ago against the Patriots on Monday night. They won that yep. game. They went to Buffalo. It was the ultimate flat spot. Now you got to go to another miserable cold weather city right before Christmas. You're not going to want nothing to do with this. You're going to want to just get back to South Beach, hang out with your family in the nice warm weather. The under is the way to go. You're going to get very little out of Miami's offense in this one. All right, so that one's lopsided. However, uh, two motivated teams here. The Rams are on the road at Tennessee. Titans looking to get themselves a win here after that disappointing loss last week to the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, Rams, of course, still favored. Six is, is where it was an open. Now it's jumped up to six and a half, even seven in some places. Seeing that right now over on Five Dimes and Bo- uh, Bovada. Links right below us to take you to SBRodds.com. Total in this one, 48, 48 and a half. Matt, you got to think that the Rams are going to come out here and look to smash. Tennessee's defense is at a a whole lot of problems this season can they slow down the rams or are we going to see another one of these huge blowouts like we saw last week with the rams and the seattle seahawks yeah i mean the rams obviously just feeding todd Gurley left and right the guy's been an absolute beast for them uh no reason to think that that's going to slow down i mean he's matchup proof at this point it doesn't really matter if you want to point to the fact that tennessee is kind of more of a funnel uh, kind of more of a funnel defense and funnels the offense to, to a pass game it doesn't really matter with with Gurley. the guy's just been been matchup proof so far they got back Robert Woods as well he caught six passes stepped right in after being out for several weeks caught six balls and, a t- and got had a self, himself a touchdown in that one on the Titans side I mean lose to the 49ers in that game where the 49ers really didn't want to win because they couldn't get in the end zone I mean like they they just kept kicking field goals and could not get in the end zone it was there for the Titans they didn't take it This seems like a very, very bad spot here, Joe. I mean, listen, we talked about this Rams team and how maybe the emotions and all these things, but then we see this team go, they're six and one straight up. I mean, I know it's it's not against this river. They're six and one on the road, so they travel well, uh, not letting these these situations and these spots be too big for them. Uh, Pretty interesting game here because the Rams, again, another team with a whole lot to play for. Too much too soon for the Rams. Look at what's happened the last four weeks. You go to Minnesota and you play a great Viking team, and it's razor thin until the fourth quarter. Vikings put it on you, you lose. No shame in that. Come home the following week, beat a really good Saints team in a premier level performance. Following week, you host Philadelphia with Carson Wentz. That comes down to the wire. You lose. You bounce back off that by going to Seattle and smashing the Seahawks. Now you're the talk of the town. Now you're the talk of the NFC. And with Carson Wentz down, these guys have got to be feeling like they can make a deep run in the playoffs. So they look at the remainder of their schedule and what do they see? A Tennessee team that just lost at San Francisco and a Week 17 home date against a relatively lousy 49ers squad. Everyone on this Ram roster has got to be feeling good. Meanwhile, Tennessee's at home. They're catching a full touchdown at most spots here at seven points. And they're playing for their playoff lives because you got about four teams jockeying for these last two spots, depending on how it plays out, you know, with Jacksonville, and Tennessee for the division. Baltimore's in there. The Chargers are in there. There's going to be a lot of of interesting developments, especially with Buffalo as well. The way I see, I'll take the seven with Tennessee. Hold your nose special, but it's going to be the ultimate contrarian play. No one's going to want the Titans. They're all going to want the Rams. I'm going to jump on Tennessee in this spot. Yeah, it's a, when I initially saw this, it was just kind of a stay away spot for me. Um, it is seems like the classic kind of Rams could could be looking past this Tennessee team as the garbage that they are, because let's be for real, this Tennessee team is absolute garbage. The fact that this team can still make the playoffs is just absurd to me. Uh, talk about the easiest one and done in the history. of We should all just sell our respective worldly possessions and just bet the money line against this Tennessee team should they make the playoffs, because whoever it is is going to beat the hell out of them. But uh, pretty good stay away spot for me here. I mean, you can see the early money coming in on the Rams, moved it to that hook and, and even to seven in some places. Uh, not really something I'm I'm going to be uh, investing in in this one. Although I do expect the Rams to, to to play well here. Wouldn't surprise me if this is kind of like a field goal win at the last minute. So the Chargers look like they could be the uh, the darlings of the AFC West and make themselves a run, and then. I ran into the buzzsaw of the Chiefs last week, and not all of their hopes are dashed, but it's pretty close. Now they're going on the road against the Jets. Sure, it's not Josh McCown. It's Bryce Petty. Uh, but the Chargers are are projected to win by a touchdown, 
Uh, touchdown and a hook. Six and a half in some places still available over on SBRodds.com. Total in this one is 42. What do you say, Matt? Yeah, on the Chargers side, like you mentioned, just got trucked by the Chiefs. I mean, go to half at 10 to 6, thinking that this is, you know, a pretty good situation for them. Then they get outscored 10 to 7 in the third and then 10 to nothing in the fourth to lose that game big. Uh, tight end Hunter Henry placed on IR with a lacerated kidney. If you guys saw Ow. how, yeah, I mean, and if you see how the splits, when Hunter Henry is targeted um, more than five times in a game and when he's not, their offensive numbers are pretty crazy. It's pretty crazy. I mean, uh, th- he's been a real big part of that team there, kind of under the radar because Keenan Allen's been having such a good season. That being said, Keenan Allen got banged up in that game. That being said, they came out and said that he should be good to go, so it shouldn't be a big deal there. On the Jet side, you mentioned Bryce Petty. Not the best debut for him. 19 of 39 for 179 yards. Threw yeah, a couple, that's bad. Threw yeah. a couple, <laughs> threw a couple picks. Good. Yeah, for him. And then on the defensive side, uh, Leonard Williams is in the concussion protocol for them, so he might not suit up for the Jets this week. Joe, this is, a, this is one of these stay-away spots for me personally. I, did, can you find a way to go, okay, I feel really good about how either of these teams are going to perform? I'll tease the Chargers down for a couple reasons yeah. here. Number okay. one, if you look at their schedule this season, they beat the bad teams. They lose to the good teams. They're just not built for prime time. You put them in a spot against New England. You put them in a spot against the cream of the crop. They're always going to find a way to lose. If you eliminate the first couple games of the year where they blew field goals against the Broncos and the Dolphins, by and large, they play poor teams and they beat them. They play really good teams and they come up short. This is a really bad team the week after losing to a relatively good team in Kansas City. Now, the travel concerns me because you're going to go to Arrowhead and then you're going to turn around and go to New York to face the Jets. But the Jets got nothing left in the tank to play for. So Bryce Petty might show up for this game because he wants to put good tape out there. But I think you've got some six and a halfs out there where you can tease it down to a half point. Chargers win. Let's remember something. In the last 21 road games, they failed to cover just six times. This is a decent road team. And here's the other thing about this Chargers team, right? Like this, The reason this plays really, really well to what they excel at is – they are able to put pressure on the passer pretty well. And now you got a Bryce Petty at quarterback as opposed to an Alex Smith. And so Alex Smith is perfectly fine being checked down Charlie. He's perfectly fine with taking sacks. He's that type of guy that can play well against a Chargers pass rush. That's not going to be the case for Bryce Petty here. This is a guy that's going to get pressured. He already threw two picks last week. I can see another couple picks, a couple short fields for the Chargers here. Chargers definitely win this game. Detroit's on the road. They're going to be at Cincinnati, and uh, Detroit is favored by three at open, and now it's up to five, and that probably has a lot to do with the fact that uh, Cincinnati's head coaches win. Yeah, you know what? I quit. I'm just uh, <laughs> I'm, do- I'm done here. Uh, 43 and a half. Now it's come down to 43. What do you say, Matt? Yeah, on the uh, Detroit side, not that big of a deal, but uh, TJ Jones, they're kind of like their number three and a half, four wide receiver, depending on the week. Uh, he's been placed on IR with a shoulder injury, so that is one less guy, I guess, uh, for Matthew Stafford to target on the Bengals side, like you mentioned, I mean, they're just a team in flux right now. All kinds of problems going on with these guys. Pretty big situation there with Joe Mixon as well, because he missed last week. Uh, he missed two weeks ago with a concussion and then did not get cleared in the concussion protocol to play this past week and had to sit out yet again. So this might be a, one of those pretty serious concussions here with this team with nothing to play for. Wouldn't surprise me if they just shut him down for the rest of the season, considering I mean, he's definitely one of the guys they're going to have to build around in Bengals 2.0 whenever Lewis leaves. The Bengals have made it really obvious for us. They played a big-time game on Monday night against the Steelers. I mean, that's as physical and violent a football game as you will see on television. And they were still very much alive in the playoff hunt. It was a relative long shot, but they were still there. And this is their most hated rival coming into their backyard on primetime. They grab a lead on these guys. They got a chance to get in it, and then they fold up shop and lose that game. Since then, they played the Bears and the Vikings, and they have been outscored 67-14. to 14. The Bengals want nothing to do with the rest of the season. The Pittsburgh game broke them. They're just looking to get to the end of this. Question is whether or not Detroit can find a way to not shoot themselves in the foot too often in a game like this. Lang five, on the road, outdoor, messy conditions for a team like the Lions who are accustomed to playing indoors most of the year. So what I would look to be safer plays, the Detroit team total, because I think they'll find a way to score. And uh, you know what? I probably will end up laying the five with the Lions as well because the Bengals have completely packed it in. With Marvin Lewis gone, they got no rallying point here. There's no reason to get up for this game. Yeah, and on first glance, I kind of felt like that I wanted to take the points with Cincinnati because this just is like one of those Detroit games 
that seems like to me that they win, but they win just ugly as hell, right? Like we've seen it time and time again from Detroit this year. They underplay to bad teams. They play down to the level of their opponent, and then they squeak it out at the end with a field goal or something like that. I feel like I wanted to get to to, to the points here. And listen, with the way that this has moved so quickly and how and how terrible this Cincinnati team has played, I'm wondering if we can get that five to a six. If we get that five to a six, that's certainly something that I feel pretty good about on the Cincinnati side here. Probably going to wait and look at this one a little bit later in the week um, and see if I can get an extra point. Uh, Buffalo and New England, both these teams playing for quite a bit. Uh, Buffalo is at New England, so they're in Foxborough for this one. And this has jumped up quite a bit. So it opened with the Patriots as 10-point favorites now, 12.5, even 13. In some places, you can get it as low as 11.5, though, currently on SBRodds.com. Matt, as far as injuries go, what do we got uh, for this game? Yeah, the Bills got Tyrod Taylor back. And, you know, listen, listen, here's the thing with Tyrod Taylor. This guy is just like a a punching bag by that organization. But when you look at his statistics compared to a lot of these guys that are starting in the NFL, this guy's a starter in the NFL. It's crazy that whenever you look at at what's going on and how they treat this guy. But anywho, he got back for the for the Bills. And obviously the Bills won this past week on the Patriots side. Rex Burkhead sprained his knee, not expected to play here. In week 16, we might see Mike Gillisley for the first time in like seven weeks. He's been a healthy scratch for for a long time, basically since Burkhead came back. But uh, one of the things about the Patriots is it doesn't really matter if one of these backs go down because they have a stable of four different guys that they've already used extensively this season. So it's just going to be one of those things where Burkhead out, Gillisley in. They still have Lewis. They still have White. So uh, just a situation where you have uh, you have this team that's just built like uh, uh, just built to win. I mean, like they just have so many guys that contribute at so many levels. Give me the Joe. Buffalo bills. You yeah. got 13 points out there on the board uh, at five dimes and at Bavada. Um, that's a lot of points. I mean, what else do you want yeah. me to say here? Right. Buffalo's not going to go to Foxborough and find an environment they're not familiar with, right? They're not going to go there and find weather that they're unfamiliar with. They're going to go there and it's going to be relatively comfortable. They've dealt with this for years. What they haven't dealt with for years is finding themselves in week 16 In a playoff spot. They haven't been to the playoffs since 1999. And they currently are in at the moment in week 16. You've got Taylor, who's a capable quarterback. You handled your business against Miami the week before. You are not set up to beat the Patriots in this game, right? You are set up to make a few plays, to show up motivated, and to find a way to pull this thing out from a cover perspective late. New England just laid all their cards on the table in that Pittsburgh game. They completely blew off the Miami game so that they could win the Pittsburgh game. They escaped Heinz Field with a win. Congratulations to them. They're going to come back this week, and they're going to be focused. But 13-point focused, it's not going to be a Patriot blowout. Right now, it's about survival to the bye week with the one seed to get ready for a Super Bowl run. Give me the bills and the points. Are either are is anyone nervous about any sort of like retaliation stuff to go on here? Obviously, the last time these two two teams met, Gronk pulled the WWE like uh, elbow off the top rope on uh, one of their too much starting corners. Yeah, there's too, too much, much at stake. stake. If if the Bills were packing it in, all that they had to do is was go hurt Gronk. Then then sure maybe, but otherwise, I'm not buying into that narrative at all. Bill, Bills can't mess around. Yeah, this New England team is going to draw a lot of money because they like to draw. Uh, the Patriots, obviously, one of the most popular uh, public teams out there this total is going to go up from 47 and i'm going to take the under right before kickoff because here's the thing buffalo does one thing very very well and that's run the ball with sean mccoy the new england Patriots do one thing very very badly and that is defend the run here lately and then you look on the other side of the ball buffalo tredavious white the guy that got the elbow from gronk actually grading out one of the better corners in the league so far this year um buffalo plays a little bit of pass defense as well not so much the run defense. I think New England's going to have a run heavy game. I think Buffalo has a run heavy game. This number gets up to 48 49, and then I take the under here and feel really good about it. All right, let's move on to uh, Jacksonville at San Francisco. So this one's actually come down for Jackson, Jacksonville a little bit uh, from five to four is what they're favored on the road in San Francisco. Jimmy Garoppolo looks like he could be that franchise quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, Matt, this is another one of my favorite spots of the week. I like Jacksonville here, and I'll just tell you why r- really quickly. It's one of those spots where Jimmy Garoppolo has been playing teams that don't have the defense that Jacksonville does. They're one of the best defenses in the entire NFL, and I think that Jimmy Garoppolo is going to have a very unwelcome surprise uh, come this weekend. So Jacksonville is one of my favorite plays, but let's head over to you as far as injuries go. Anything of, of note? 
Yeah, I mean, on the Jaguar side, Marquise Lee, who's their leading receiver there, did go down. Leonard Fournette did not play this past week either. They still were able to score 45 points. Blake Bortles was still able to throw for over 320 yards. So you can see that the Jaguars, even when they don't are missing a couple of key pieces there, still able to get it done, right? I mean, they've got some pieces in there that are able to uh, step in. I mean, listen, on the running back side of things, I mean, they're pretty deep when you look at TJ Yeldon, and then you got Chris Ivory as well, even if Leonard Fournette's not able to go. And then on the receiver side, D.D. Westbrook, a rookie, has stepped up. They got Keelan Cole, who has stepped up to play. So they got some guys there that, that can make some plays for Jaguar uh, for the Jaguars. And of course, that defense, very, very good. On the 49ers side, Jimmy G. Fever, obviously sweeping the nation. I think it's in this line as well. I think it's yep. baked in. I think that this line is artificially kind of where it is right now. Listen, he had a great game. He threw for 381 yards against the Titans. The problem is, is they can't score any touchdowns. He's only got three touchdowns and two picks on the season. They kick 400 field goals every time they get, they get to the red zone. When their red zone, tar- listen, Marquise Goodwin's their best receiver. He's five foot nine. I mean, like they don't have any sort of red zone uh, receiver. They have no red zone attack whatsoever. I mean, George Kittle is their best red zone target right now. You know, I mean, and and so this is like. A 49er team that just doesn't score the ball. I mean, I might even look to the under as well here, Joe. I mean, I think there's a couple different reasons uh, that to, to think that this is a, a game that Jacksonville plays really well in and, and certainly ha- has their way with this 49er team. I mean, I live here, and I'm right in the middle of Jimmy G fever. I got a 10-month-old son who one of his first Christmas presents is going to be a Jimmy G jersey. That thing's already <laughs> been ordered. Um, but I am going to take the Jaguars, and I am going to take the under in this game for two reasons. The Dave hit the nail on the head with the step up in caliber of the Jacksonville defense to get a little bit more specific. How are Marquise Goodwin, who you just mentioned and Trent Taylor and any of the other San Francisco wide receivers going to uncover in this game? That's going to be the biggest they're problem. They're not. Exactly. exactly. That's going to be the biggest problem. You're going up against Jalen Ramsey and AJ Boye, who's been one of without question, the best one, two tandems at cornerback in the league. You've got a pass rush. You've got a ton going your way right now. You got a date with Tennessee next week. You just handle your business and you're going to be in a great situation. The Niners haven't scored a lot. They take their time with the ball. I don't see any of that working here. I like under 42 because I think if you're smart with Jacksonville, you're just going to want to run it, play to the strength of yourself, play to the weakness of the 49er defense. This game's got an ugly physical affair written all over it. I could see it somewhere around, I don't know, 20 to 6, maybe 20 to 10 when it's all said and done. Jacksonville covers, game stays under the total. Yeah, I already tipped my hand in this one. That's kind of where I'm leaning as well. I think Jacksonville plays well. I think that they cover. I also think the under is very much in play. I uh, certainly want to see how things play out this week with Leonard Fournette, whether they're going to have him back or not. Uh, and the Marquise Lee thing is still pretty big. I mean, listen, whenever you're looking at a guy that's your leading receiver, him being out is certainly nothing to just kind of scoff at or anything like that. But like you mentioned, Joe, 49ers were playing at the fastest pace in the league whenever – Uh, Before Jimmy Garoppolo stepped in, that has slowed down significantly with him under center. So another reason to kind of, if you want some more confirmation bias as to why you could lean to the under in this one. Next game, pretty gross one here. Uh, The Giants at uh, the Arizona Cardinals. Rumblings of Bruce Arians, whether or not he's going to stick around after the season. Drew Stanton is back under center for the Arizona Cardinals. But uh, this game, Arizona's favored by three and a half. Total is 40. This is one that I want nothing to do with, Matt. Yeah, Giants side of the ball. I mean, listen. Eli Manning goes out and throws for 434 yards and they still lose. So, I mean, they find a way to lose after he goes out and throws for over 430 yards. You mentioned the quarterback switch there for the Cardinals. Also, they're on like their fifth running back now. Uh, Kerwin Williams, who has, who's the fill in for the fill in, uh, has a quad injury. So he is very, very questionable this week. Obviously a quad injury for running back is a very big deal. Uh, probably closer to the doubtful side than he is to the questionable side. So, here we are with them having to fill in like running back literally number five this year for for how they're going to plug that gap there. Um, this game just is, oh, God. This game just has disgusting yeah. written Get all away. over it. That being, said, that being said, I have had a lot of success when I see 40s and unders and teasing that number down and playing the over. Like I have had a ton of success when I can get the number under 35. And I'm going to look very, very hard at this one. I see there is already a 39 and a half out there, so I could get this thing down to 33 and a half. And you got to think, like, a very horrible, terrible game could can still get 34, can still score 34 points. I mean, that's 17 to 17, you know? Just Bet has 39 and a half right now. Joe, what do you say? 
I'm going to be just very concise here. I want nothing to do with this game. I have no side, no total, yep. no dog in the fight. I'm not even going to put any more time into it. it this is a stay away completely for me. All right. Uh, on to Seattle and Dallas. And uh, look, D- D- Dallas had a rough time with the Raiders on Sunday night, and Seattle got absolutely crushed, just just embarrassed by the Rams Are you on gonna- Sunday. Are you guys going to apologize to me or what? Are we, with this whole Russell Wilson thing, can no, you finally? Russell Wilson's still a great quarterback. Can dude. you finally like, admit? Can you finally admit your mistake? And you oh, was, it, the, was it the Russell air? Wilson that gave up the forty-two points to the? I would, was he out there on defense? I must have missed that part. Oh um, well, he, he was he was he was fourteen of thirty for one hundred and forty-two yards. So I mean, not, that, not, not that a great game for Russell Wilson. That certainly helps yeah. his case. Yeah, yeah. All right, but but so Dallas didn't exactly light the world on fire either. They struggled mightily against, and I mean, they very well could have lost that game to the Raiders, who have had all sorts of problems. Problems of their own. Of course, Matt, the big news this week is that, yep, Zeke is coming back. Zeke's going to be back. Um, and, and really, the, the only other thing here, and this is one of those deals that is bigger than it seems because we've seen this play out already this year for this Cowboys team. Their tackle, Tyron Smith, questionable after injuring his knee last week. At, and we've as seen. As of Tuesday, MRI that he had on that leg said that it didn't rule him out for the week. So there's still a possibility, yeah. but yeah, getting out of that lineup is, is a big problem. And, and so this is one of those things that we've seen play out that like, you know, you say like, okay, it's an offensive lineman, but we've seen him out this year and we've seen what happens to this team when he is out and it's a big, big, big drop off. So certainly something we're going to be watching uh, throughout the course of the week here. But again, you get Zeke back, a fresh-legged Zeke who is was dominating. I mean, absolutely having his way with every team he played against uh, up until his suspension was actually enacted here. Um, I, I can't see any reason not to expect a smash again. I mean, we saw Todd Gurley, a very similar running back and a very similar skill set to that of Ezekiel Elliott, go absolutely ham on this Seattle team last week. And that was at Seattle's place. Now Seattle's got to travel to Dallas and face Zeke in their place. Uh, I mean, for me, this, this could be a smash spot yet again. I'm 47 or 47 game. and a half. Sorry, Joe. And uh, just right. so you guys know, Dallas uh, favored by five currently in almost all the books at home. Circle this game, and while I'm not going to write this article, I'm going to throw the idea out there and someone else can write it. That Jacksonville game for the Seahawks two weeks ago, that's going to be viewed as the game that ended the Seahawks dynasty. And it wasn't so much a dynasty that's going using a bit of hyperbole here, but the Seattle, Seattle run, the window being open, that Jacksonville game ended it. And the iconic image is going to be one of the Seattle players trying to get into the stands to fight one of the Jacksonville players. Because after that loss, they came back and got absolutely boat raced at home by the Rams. The division is gone. Next year, Earl Thomas might not be back. Richard Sherman might not be back. Michael Bennett might not be back. Your offensive line's a mess. Your head coach is the oldest in the National Football League. You don't have a running back. You've got no running game whatsoever. And everywhere you look, the league is passing you by. They're not winning at home anymore. They're not winning at home in primetime anymore. They're going on the road. People don't fear them. And they've got a shot in this game. And here's where it's going to get interesting. Earlier in the day, the Saints are going to beat the Falcons, which is going to open up the number six seed in the NFC. Now, Detroit's going to beat Cincinnati, so they're going to slide right in. And Dallas and Seattle are going to be bucking for that last spot. I think you get a big flat spot here. Russell Wilson's going to try to get Seattle motivated. I think see, I think the Jaguars cracked him two weeks ago. And I think moving forward, you're going to see big changes for Seattle this offseason. As long as they have Wilson, they're going to be a team that has a chance to contend. But in terms of being a legitimate Super Bowl contender, I think those days are over. Legion of Boom going to become the Legion of Whom next year. Woo! Hey, it just I wish, can you, can you pick it I stole up? That. Just, I stole that hey, from earlier. Can you, can you, at least just, I, I know you can't drop the mic, but can you pick it up and sit it back down at least? Like just, can you just, can it's you at least expensive? So yeah, no, 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 yeah, uh, yeah. metaphorically, we, we get it. I mean, <laughs> again, I, I, I tip my hand here in the, uh, I tip my hand here in the intro. Uh, this seems like a perfect game to tease down to where just Dallas, all they have to do is win. They're going to win at home here. Look, we saw Todd Gurley, like I said, have his way. I mean, he did every anything he wanted to. I mean, literally did anything he wanted to against the Seattle defense. And now they've got to go on the road to Dallas to a guy that hasn't played in six weeks who has the freshest legs of any elite running back in the NFL right now, who literally has one of the most similar skill sets to Todd Gurley of anybody in the league other outside of Le'Veon Bell. So, I mean, this is just sets up so friggin' perfectly for Dallas with so much to play for here. It, it would It would shock me 
if Seattle went into Dallas in this situation and didn't get trucked. Like, I think this is another situation where, like, I mean, I'm such a, I, I look at these things, I know I shouldn't, but like, I might even look at the alternate line on Dallas come come game day, and I, you might see me betting like Dallas minus 10 in this one or something. Like, Careful, you know, son, it, it's still Jason Garrett. Careful. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and again, like the Cowboys, they're getting Zeke back, but like you said about Tyron Smith, and they did struggle against the Raiders, who are also terrible. Let's talk about the the Christmas Day games, because we have two for you on Christmas Day. First one, bit of a stinker, uh, Pittsburgh and Houston. Uh, Pittsburgh is on the road at Houston, and they are still huge favorites. Uh, opens up at 10.5. It's come down to 8.5 in a, a couple of places, 9.5, still seeing 10 out there in a few spots. Total here at 44 um, Matt, obviously Antonio Brown has got to be making the headlines here. Yeah. I mean, lots to talk about. I mean, you got Steelers coming off of a very emotional loss that they thought they won because of the whole, did he catch it? Did he not catch it? What is a catch? What isn't a catch? Yada, yada, yada. Then you got Antonio Brown, who's definitely out for this game. Um, probably out for the rest of the regular season. Then he'll come back in the playoffs, uh, try to give it a go. But again, you talk to a lot of these injury experts with, this like partially torn calf muscle that he's got. And basically it's going to be very, very tough for Antonio Brown to be Antonio Brown basically for the rest of this, which doesn't bode well for my Super Bowl pick, which was the Steelers before the season started. They also signed running back Steven Ridley today. Uh, backup running back James Conner had to have surgery on his knee. He is on IR for the rest of the season. And we talked about this last week on the show, and Joe Hayden actually gave it kind of a go uh, in pregame and decided he just wasn't able to go. And uh, that being said, he was very, very close last week and said he is going to be back this week. A big, big uptick for that pass defense who really only has to worry about DeAndre Hopkins. And then on the Texan side, they place Tom Savage on IR. God, if it was anyone other than these loser Texans right now, I mean, you got to figure you look at Pittsburgh and here's how the situation shakes down. They should be emotionally crushed, right? Like they should they be a should team be. That, that you would say like, okay, this is the spot. But like you said, I mean, it's just, it's this you, Texans team. That, They're there's not, that. Like, and then here's the other thing they got to worry about. They got a game up on Jacksonville. Who's going to end up beating the 49ers as we talked about earlier. And if you blow this game, Jacksonville's got the tiebreaker over you by way of coming in the Heinz field earlier in the season and smashing Roethlisberger in that, what, five interception game. So you have no way you can spend this week feeling sorry for yourself because the last thing you want to do is go from a Patriot calamity, but still having a bye week in the two seed to all of a sudden hosting on wild card weekend and having to deal with that bullshit against one of these Tennessee type teams who's just yeah. going to waste 60 minutes of your time and you'll probably end up suffering one or two key injuries that'll further hurt your chances against the Patriots. But again, it's Houston. Houston's lost seven of eight. They've lost four straight by seven, 11, 10, and then 38 against Jacksonville where they Ugh. didn't give a damn about that game. So it's probably a stay away. All that, all that talk. It's probably a stay away. Yeah. I'm trying to find a way to get behind Houston here, to be honest. There are some tens out there. Maybe a ten and a half. I'll sprinkle a little bit. It, it's like it, with this thing being all over the place, it's really hard to sit and make a, a, a recommendation right now because you see the eight and a halfs and you go, okay, I can get this. The, I can tease this under the field goal, right? Which is like I always look That's for not two. Bad. I always look for two two and a halves and eight eight and a halves to see if I can get the, to the through the two key numbers. And, and listen, here's the thing. Yes, Antonio Brown is going to be out. They still have Juju Smith-Schuster. They still have Martavis Bryant, who actually has been playing well. They still have Eli Rogers. They still have Jesse James. And you still have Le'Veon Bell, who, by the way, is basically a wide receiver playing running back. I mean, they line him up in the slot. They are, they feel no problem whatsoever playing this guy basically as a receiver as well. So it's not like they're hurting here. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they got a lot of talent to play with. And like you mentioned, Joe, the buy is even more important now because not having to play and giving Antonio Brown an extra week to not feel like he has to be out on that field is huge for this Steelers team if they think that they really have a chance to challenge the Patriots and, and represent the AFC in the Super Bowl this week. So it seems to me eight and a halves getting that thing down to under a field goal feels really good. And then when you look at the tens, you go, wow, the 10 feels kind of good on the Houston side. So it's like, there, there's a couple of different angles. It depends on, I guess, how your, how your gut tells you here. Me personally, I'll admit, I'll probably end up taking the eight and a half down to two and a half. Um, it's just something I always look for, uh, especially when I think that the team is, is so far superior to the other team as far as as far as talent level, right? I mean, we are talking about a Houston team that's going to play TJ Yates. I mean, guys, you, you, both of you, I can't believe that you're missing it. The real value of this game 
is to ignore your annoying family on Christmas Day. You don't have to bet this one. <laughs> hey, this is a Christmas Day game. <laughs> There's plenty of reasons not to bet on this particular game. I would stay away personally. I see what you're saying, Matt. I get how you can make a case on both sides, but both both cases have faults to it, right? So you can't really trust what Houston's going to do in this game on Christmas T. Day. J. Yates. Yeah. T.J. Yeah. Yates. I know. I know. All right, let's okay. move on to our final game, also on Christmas Day, Oakland and Philadelphia. Oakland on the road, disappointing loss last week to Dallas. Uh, Philadelphia got the win, but just sort of eked by the Giants. Look, Nick Foles uh, is not a bad quarterback as far as backups go in, in the NFL. 48-and-a-half is what it opens at. It's come down a bit to 47. Uh, Philadelphia favored by a nine, even a 10 over at five dimes. Again, all of these links and changing lines up on SBRodds.com in real time. Over to you, Matt. Yeah, on the Raiders side, uh, tackle Donald Penn out for the remainder of the season with a foot injury. So he's going to be done for them. And on the Eagles side, like you mentioned, Nick Foles, look, wasn't like this incredibly huge standout performance, but he was 24 of 38, 237 through four touchdowns and didn't throw a pick, right? And this is kind of what we said last week when we were evaluating this Eagles team is, this guy's going to step in and be able to play. You know, I mean, he's going to step in and be able to hold his own. Is he Carson Wentz? Of course not. But it's not like you're throwing TJ Yates in there or anything like that. I mean, you're getting Nick Foles here. It, really, the concerning thing, if you want to be a, a contrarian here, is on the Eagles side of the ball is they let Eli Manning throw for 434 yards against them last week. I mean, this is one of those scenarios, Joe, where We'd like to see these teams, whenever their leaders and their their all stars or whatever go down, you like to think that they rally, and that's even on both sides of the ball. And that was far from the case in that game last week. I think the rally's coming here because there was this emotional letdown, like, oh man, we lost the MVP and Wentz. Now we're not going to win the Super Bowl. And then Foles comes and balls out while everyone else is feeling sorry for themselves. Nick Foles is out there throwing for four touchdowns, and I think that may have woken up the locker room to the fact where it's like, all right, look. Maybe we can grab the one seed, get a bye. We win one game at home in the divisional round, which is reasonable with Nick Foles. Not saying it happens, but it's reasonable. Suddenly you're in the NFC Championship game, and then anything can happen to get to the Super Bowl. So the way I see it, this team's going to be motivated because it's Christmas at Lincoln Financial Field. I can't remember the last time this happened, but I do remember being at the link for they a threw, Thursday they night. They threw batteries at Santa Claus. I remember that, yeah. Oh, my God. I remember <laughs> That was so long ago. <laughs> And uh, I think that was Veterans Stadium, to be honest with you. Probably was, yeah. I was at the link for a Thanksgiving game. The one and only time they played on Thanksgiving against Arizona, and they smashed the Cardinals in that game. Um, So here's what I'm thinking. You win here, and it's over for the number one seed. It's yours. You can go ahead and chill in Week 17. Minnesota, even if they can tie you overall, they're not going to win the tiebreaker by way of the conference record. You're already 10-1. and They've got eight wins. They're not going to be able to get there, if my math is correct. So the way I see this one with Philadelphia, I have no problem teasing it down. Even though if it lands on three, I'll play that. I'm actually going to consider the 10 because I don't think Oakland wants anything to do with this game. The Kansas City game two weeks ago was for the division. They mailed it in. The Dallas game, they had seven yards in the opening 16 minutes. Cowboys let them back in. And then late, they're missing field goals. The stupid index card. Everyone in Oakland is blaming this index (laughs) card when they played this awful football game. This absolutely awful football (sighs) game where the franchise quarterback fumbles the ball through the back of the end zone at the end of the game. These dudes have completely checked out on the season. Donald Penn's done. Oakland wants nothing to do with Del Rio or anything else. That guy's probably going to be back. They just want the offseason. Give me the Eagles in a tease, and I'll think about laying the 10-2 because I think you get nothing from the Raiders in this game. So the only re- it, if you buy into reading between the lines here, I almost feel like this is one of those situations where if I get a 10, I might tease this thing like up to 16 points because Philadelphia has said they would like to get Nate Sudfeld some reps because they feel like uh, with you know the whole Foles situation that they kind of know what they have in Nick Foles and if something by you know god awful were to happen to Nick Foles that they want Sudfeld to have some reps in this game. What I can see is exactly the scenario you're talking about, Joe, play out, but then Oakland gets some garbage time, get some garbage time scores here. I think I think Philadelphia comes out and smashes early, like absolutely balls out. First here. half wager. 
First half right, wager. Right. Like a first half type wager. And then they try to and they follow through with what they were saying. They want to get Sudfeld some reps. They're going to be very, very conservative with him. They just want him to get some game feel. They, if he has to get inserted into a game to where he's not going to crap his pants whenever he gets in there and, and things like that. I mean, seriously, I mean, this is what they're looking for. They understand what they've got here. I mean, they've got a real chance to, to make some noise. So I might get that thing up really, really high and, and bank on garbage time. And I think that that's probably a very likely scenario here. I think Philadelphia. First half, like you said, Joe, great, 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 probably uh, a wager on that side. They get up really, really big, take the foot off the gas. Oakland comes back and gets you a backdoor cover. And to round us out today on the Play Action Podcast, our best bets of the week. Joe, you're up first. Go ahead, man. I think it's going to be a relative consensus with you guys as well because, Dave, you've touched on all the games I like here as well. Uh, New Orleans, number one. Yep. Jacksonville, number two. And the yep. Jacksonville under against the Niners, number three. Those are going to be my top three plays this week, boys. Matt, I'll kick it to you. It's going to be I, – I, listen, I'm not going to give something different just for the sake of giving something different. I love, love, love New Orleans. I love Jacksonville this week, and I don't think there's any reason for me to try to give a different play just to, just to give a different play. Those are the games that I'm going to probably be most heavily invested in this week, so those are the games that I feel the most comfortable about. All right. See all of the lines changing in real time. Find the links to the books, the reviews of the books, and so much more. SBRodds.com alongside Joe Fortenbaugh and Matt Brown. My name's Dave Farah. Happy holidays, everyone. We will see you again next week for week number 17 of the NFL.